Hi, Greta. Um, if you want to continue with this presentation, I guess we'll have to get started a little early. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I accidentally pressed something. <laughs> well, it seems that we've Hello, and welcome to the fifth and final webinar of our Let's Talk Disease series presented by the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs and Greenhouse Canada magazine. Before we begin, take a look at the GoToWebinar control panel to your right. Click the little arrow on the questions tab near the bottom. This is where you can submit questions throughout the webinar. Our presenter today will also be referring to her handouts, which are available in the handouts tab below. A recording of this webinar, as well as a copy of the handouts, will also be made available on our website at greenhousecanada.com and sent out after 24 hours to anyone who's registered. Now, if you're not already familiar with the voice of our moderator today, it's Dr. Sarah Jandersik, who is the Greenhouse Floriculture IPM Specialist in Ontario, responsible for both IPM of insects and plant diseases. Welcome, Sarah. Thanks, Greta. Um, hi everyone, it's my pleasure to introduce you today to our uh, last and foremost speaker, um, Dr. Jana Beckerman. She's um, a professor in botany and plant pathology at Purdue University, and she leads the plant pathology extension education effort in horticultural crops by developing and enhancing a close working relationship between universities, extension educators, and members of the fruit and ornamental industries. The goal of her extension program is to enable commercial growers to effectively and sustainably manage both chemical and genetic resources while protecting the environment. Uh, welcome, Jenna, and please take it away. Thanks so much. Uh, well, I guess we will just get started, and I will apologize for the completely uninspired um, title slide. I just, I really could not come up with anything that I thought was catchy, which isn't normally like me, but hopefully the rest of the talk will just be uphill from here. So, one of the things uh, I really want to focus on is on using the most effective fungicides. Uh, when I began in extension, people uh, were regularly getting a lot of information regarding the cultural controls, and then they would get to a section that would say, consult your local extension educator or extension specialist regarding the specifics. And it seemed that very few people actually knew about the specifics, and that certainly uh, wasn't actually being published online. So I want to talk about that, but before I do that, in order to get the most out of your fungicides, you really need to make sure that you have the correct diagnosis. Um, without that correct diagnosis, uh, a lot of fungicides uh, would, are simply not your best options. So uh, one of the examples I, I have down at the bottom is something like ProStar, which is very specific for just the Cidiomycetes, or I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, Clary's 3336 or whatever generic version of thiophanate methyl you use. Um, and uh, that's very good for ascomycetes, but isn't going to work for rusts, for example. So making sure your diagnosis is correct is, is really key. And so early on, one of the things I did with my colleague uh, Cliff Stadoff was develop some apps titled the Purdue Plant Doctor. And we obtained funding to actually do this work, but the funding did not include any money for um, promoting it. So I think it's one of the best kept uh, secrets regarding diagnosing plant health problems. And this would be insects and diseases and abiotic problems. And uh, the apps, the most expensive app is all of $2. Um, and it includes several hundred images of plant health problems to help you with the diagnostic process. So real quick, going with uh, everyone's old favorite, uh, favorite here, uh, downy mildew uh, causing uh, problems on impatiens. And uh, you go through the process, you can start with either looking up the host, if you know what the host is, um, or starting with what you think the name of the disease is, if you thought instead of this being downy mildews that it was rhizoctonia. And then you'd have a description for some of the symptoms, and you can go through and get extended uh, descriptions, you can get more photos. Um, and you could also see the stages of the disease and for homeowners at least uh, what's actually used for control. One of the things that uh, 
we tried to do, which will work for Ontario just as effectively as it does for Indiana, is put things in the order which we see them. So uh, at the time we did this, uh, impatience downy mildew was the number one problem. So that was the first thing that popped up. And rhizoctonia root rot came a little later on. So if you haven't already seen those, please check those out um, because they really do help with the diagnostic process. The next thing to bring up, and uh, I like to joke about this, that every plant pathologist has to show the, the disease triangle and, and hold their hand up in the form of a triangle because uh, it's like our benediction in a way. Um, and one of the reasons I like to, to focus in on this is it's a very simple model to understand uh, how you can manage a problem. And this model says that in order for disease to occur, you need a susceptible host, uh, a pathogen, and a favorable environment. And when these things come together, uh, disease is the uh, inevitable outcome. One of the ways you can manage this in looking at the disease triangle before you start reaching for your fungicides is trying to uh, manipulate the environment, which is something that we can actually do in a greenhouse much more effectively than we can uh, out in any sort of field situation. But we could also manipulate the host plant or our choice of host. One of the nice things working about annuals instead of uh, one of my other commodities like apples is if something doesn't work for you one year, you can change it the next year. And uh, that doesn't work so well with uh, tree fruit or woody ornamentals, but uh, for annuals and bedding plants, it's a, a really great option. And then of course, there's always you know mitigating the pathogen and trying to make sure that you're working under um, the best situation or conditions that you can to uh, promote plant health. So when we talk about breaking up the uh, disease triangle, we can modify either the environmental conditions, we can choose a more resistant host, or we can work on um, mitigating the pathogen or even excluding it and keeping it out completely. So when we talk about susceptible hosts, uh, I always like to go to, at least here in Indiana, a, a big part of cut flower production are uh, peonies. And I saw this uh, photo by my favorite restaurant uh, literally outside its door, and I was just so excited, but I didn't have a camera. This was kind of early cell phone days, and so I had to go back home and the next day come back and take a photo. But you can see that the Festiva Maximus, Festivus Maxima on the left, is far more powdery mildew resistant than the one on the right. And even though the powdery mildew really makes the flowers pop, uh, it's probably going to be a lot more difficult to manage that plant um, and try and keep it looking uh, good even for cut flower productions. The powdery mildew is on the, the stem, it's on the sepals. Um, it's really a mess for that peony on the right. So starting with resistant varieties is a really great way of managing your plant disease problems. Um, so uh, what does it mean by the susceptible genetics or, or choosing these varieties? Well, sometimes it's not quite as obvious as what I showed you. And here's another example, and I apologize again, not a cut flower, but um, you can see escargot in the foreground right over here is far more susceptible to powdery mildew than any of these other begonias. And my recommendation um, is, unless it's absolutely necessary, I would just get rid of the, this one cultivar of begonia. Um, if it isn't you know, if it is uh, a variety that you absolutely have to have, then we can start talking about fungicides. But the easiest thing to do is, whenever possible, dispense with your, your problem children. Um, so one of the things we put together uh, at Purdue is a list of some of the most common annuals and perennials that are resistant here. And we just did some preliminary cost-benefit analyses. And these cost-benefit analyses actually show that um, Resistant seed is uh, at the most five cents more costly than susceptible seed, which ends up being a difference of $50 per thousand plants. Um, and so this is actually the equivalent of three quarters of an application of compass. And I probably should adjust these now. I think this was uh, calculated 10 years ago now that I think of it. Um, but you can see that just incorporating resistance is you have something that um, you don't need the chemical inputs. For cut flower production, what this means is uh, a lot less management. It also generally results in a much better outcome if you are producing these plants, uh, bedding plants for the landscape. Uh, it generally means that you end up with a happier client. And this handout is available over in the handout section that uh, Greta and Sarah had mentioned earlier to you. 
Well, so this doesn't only work just on bedding plants, but uh, thinking about this all throughout the landscape industry and also with ornamentals. And just keep in mind, because some cut flower growers and uh, at least here in the Midwest, we have uh, quote unquote cut flower growers who uh, are producing holly uh, berries. They're using uh, dogwood flowers. They're often using even lilacs. Um, it uh, holds true just as much for the woody plants as it does for um, uh, any of our annual bedding plants or cut flowers as well. So this next picture here is a scene from a grower that I worked with and this was with woody plants and, and this is really I think one of the best ways of understanding Philaviopsis root rot which is a huge problem in cut flower production. It's a huge problem in bedding plant production. It's also a very big problem in the nursery and of course if it gets in any of these places it will eventually end up in the landscape. Uh, here in Indiana and I know um, in parts of Canada the water can be very alkaline because of the uh, limestone that we all exist off of. And you can see these two different uh, plots. This one was actually using well water that was uh, a much lower pH, and this was actually using the city water uh, that came from the Ogallala Aquifer. And the pH is generally, um, it's most acidic is probably 8.3 if you can believe that. And I've seen it get up to nine and over actually towards late August. Um, and this is what actually is creating the conducive environment here for Philaviopsis. Philaviopsis, particularly with pansies, calibrachoa, um, actually, I think it's over 300 plants, uh, really prefer this uh, uh, alkaline environment and this drives the Philaviopsis disease. Of course, it isn't just um, the Laviopsis that could be a conducive environment, any environment that's far too wet. I think all of us, you know, particularly if you're growing outside, this is gonna be a bigger problem than in a greenhouse uh, situation, but having an environment that's far too wet is going to predispose you to all of the oomycetes and the water molds. In this case, you're seeing uh, pythium problems on um, uh, poinsettia, but for cut flowers, we've seen these types of pythium problems out in fields for um, chrysanthemum production and other daisy type flower production. And last but not least would be your immune or your resistant host. And uh, this is just one of my favorite photos because who doesn't like a field of green sticks? I know it's personally one of my favorite. Um, when we talk about resistance, we oftentimes confuse it with immunity. And here you can see something that's immune. These allocasias, calocasias, or whatever the taxonomists have changed their name to this week, will never get in patients downy mildew. Um, and this is what immunity is. Resistance is more of what you see when you compare an inpatients walleriana to an inpatients balsamia, uh, the, the balsam inpatients, or any of the other species for that matter. Um, Resistance can actually break down over time. We see this for roses. We've seen this with uh, crab apples. We've seen this with uh, lots of plants. And so it is something to be aware of. Um, it pretty much goes back that you don't want to rely on any one process when you're managing your plant disease. So what do we do uh, to, to try and uh, make everything sustainable? Well, one of the first things in managing the environment is the cultural control. And this also manages the pathogen, keeping things clean, um, making sure you remove infected plant parts before the disease actually spreads. If you do have an outbreak eradicating it from the greenhouse or the growing area, um, particularly for things um, uh, such as bacterial blight of any type, which can just spread like wildfire, um, if you were into aster production um, as a cut flower, this probably is not something you want to have by your pine trees as um, your two needle pines can be an alternate host for um, one of the pine aster rust, a commandra rust, uh, which I've actually seen infecting uh, cut flower growers in the field. So we've cleaned things up. We try and make sure we have the appropriate water and the right conditions. We make sure we have a diagnosis and then we need to be sure we understand what it means to spray pesticides. And this requires, you know, being able to be thorough, making sure that you can apply all the applications that may be required. 
Uh, fungicides are not like insecticides. There are many insecticides where one application is sufficient for disease control all, field, all season long. And that unfortunately is not the case for most plant pathogens. The next thing I think people need to be reminded of is that fungicides don't cure plants. And I know we, we all on some level know this, but um, I think being human and having grown up by like putting Neosporin on our, our owies and we see that it heals, we sort of expect fungicides uh, to do the same thing. And with plants, there, there's nothing we can do to heal any sort of injury or wound. The best we can hope for is that it's compartmentalized. So in order to keep any aesthetic damage from occurring, we want to make sure the fungicides are applied before the disease or the pathogen actually gets there, and certainly before symptoms develop. Um, and to always keep in mind that fungicides protect new uninfected growth from disease. It's not going to actually cure the plant. And in order to do this, particularly with these um, rapidly growing herbaceous plants, we need to uh, apply fungicides regularly. If the plant stopped growing, we might be able to uh, cut back the number of applications, but the fact that the plant is growing all season long means that we will be applying multiple applications. And the thoroughness and efficacy that we have has a lot to do with how frequently we spray. Um, and so if you only just apply one or two applications early on and stop, you're going to see your disease problem generally just go exponentially for most uh, foliar and even root rot diseases. Um, if you stop later on, you'll get slightly better control. But in order to keep that disease level down to uh, where it doesn't have an uh, aesthetic impact, you do want to be applying if plants are actively growing, possibly up to every week, depending on the product you're using. And if you're using biologicals, you might want to go as quickly as every two to three days. So I think I said all of this, um, and I'm going to just jump to the next slide regarding timing is everything. And this is, um, I would say this is my backyard cut flower production slash Detritus experiment. Um, I was growing lilies in my backyard and I still like lilies unlike everybody else I know who grows them in the industry and can't stand the smell of them. Um, but I like lilies and I had several in my backyard. I had noticed after several years the development of just a few little spots which you know really aren't that huge of a deal so you think and I'm like ah this is a great opportunity to see how this disease progresses. And it was a very wet spring. And here you can see uh, these are tiger lilies that were nearby. Um, it's starting to get a lot worse. And like many foliar diseases, it's working from the bottom up. And within a week after that of constant rain, everything just absolutely exploded. And this is what I mean by that this exponential growth. Um, I wasn't using any fungicides. I figure I spray enough at, at work. Uh, I don't need to take my work home with me, even though apparently I do quite often. Um, and this was the outcome. I didn't have cut flowers and I did not have uh, really much anything. So when do you want to apply? I'm going to go back and show you a picture here. Um, this is probably too late. You want to apply before you even see these things. Um, so in this case, recommendations would include probably starting the application about the time flower buds begin developing. And then since this would be outdoor production, this would be applying fungicides. Since it was wet, probably about every week, depending on um, the fungicide. Now, obviously, I'm in the US, I'm in uh, Indiana, and we have very different recommendations than you do. So I want to really um, uh, push you towards using the Guide to Greenhouse Floriculture Production that OMAFRA puts out. It's actually, uh, it's fantastic. And uh, I'm trying to think of doing something similar to it for our growers here in Indiana. Um, of course, you could use your the, the apps because they do provide you a lot of that information. Um, Plant Pathology by Agrios is like a staple for everybody. And then of course, there's the old Westcott's Plant Disease Handbook. I would say buy an older edition since the new one is about $670. So, oops, let's see. 
All right, so I'm going to go and share a video with you. And uh, let me see, here's my sharing. And go to uploaded videos. Understanding the mode of action of the chemistry available to the chemistry of I'm sorry, to it's me. Just, just bear with it. Ultimately, increasing yield. Triazoles are single site chemistry that are locally systemic and more mobile in plant tissues than other fungicides. Following application, the active ingredient is readily taken up by the leaves and moves within the leaf where it inhibits the production of the disease and actively stops production of the new fungi spores. Chlorothalonil is a non-systemic multi-site foliar fungicide and works by targeting various enzymes and the metabolic development of the fungus. Providing protective activity before the disease enters the leaf, it inhibits spore germination and destroys fungal cell membranes. Chlorothalonil should be used as a partner product with other fungicides such as triazoles for best results. Folpet is a multi-site protectant with no known resistance. Acting on three different cellular levels, Folpet disrupts cell production, inhibits the division of the germ tube, and interferes with the energy production of the fungus. Folpet doesn't inhibit partner product uptake, but instead optimizes the efficacy of the curative partner chemistry, which maintains its activity, allowing systemic movement into the new plant growth. Okay, going back to the sharing now. Let's see, going back to the main screen. So what is, so the reason I like showing that video is I think that explains it better and it, it doesn't make it quite so mysterious. Um, and there's a couple of reasons I wanted to show that to you because I think if we are going to um, be successful and sustainable, we need to have a variety of different fungicides in our arsenal. And uh, you guys are actually undergoing a re-registration period where several products will actually be uh, canceled. And this is something that I would encourage you to seriously think about and contact uh, your, your representatives regarding um, if this is something you want to do. Here in the United States, I can tell you, obviously we have uh, very different views on um, pesticides for better or for worse. And more often than not, I would say for worse, but um, I consider Dacanil, um, we don't have full pet. I consider Dacanil a really important uh, rotation partner uh, for use in ornamental production in uh, cut flower and in the greenhouse. And I would say the same with uh, Ipridione as well. And I would be very concerned if these were actually going to be uh, uh, taken away from me because these are the only products that there is no risk. Well, excuse me, Dacanil and Fulpet are the only two products where the risk of resistance in the pathogen population is negligible. So why am I saying you need to be concerned about this with your fungicides? There are a lot of new fungicides on the market. There are even more biological products on the market. In using those products, which have a risk of resistance and a history in the case of biological control of not working as well as conventional fungicides, that risk trade-off is now going into your lap. And so what's going on is the public is telling you that you need to assume the risk for your crop um, in addition to assuming the risk for uh, any of the economic impacts should these alternative products fail to work. I'm not saying there isn't a risk. Everything is um, about risk and managing it. But in my opinion, um, these pesticide regulations provide uh, very few benefits to the general public because they aren't in contact with these products that much to begin with. And when they are, they're in greatly reduced rates. Um, but I do think it does create a risk for the farmer and it creates a r risk for farm workers. But more importantly, there's the ag 
uh, the economic risk. And so these are some of the things you really want to think about um, for yourself. Um, I think this is uh, something that has to be based on what you actually uh, need to choose as far as what your values are. So for me, I like using protectant fungicides because they are an insurance policy and a cleanup step against uh, fungicide resistance. Here is some uh, work that I did. Imagine trying to spray an entire crab apple tree or apple tree. This was protected with mancozeb, which is very similar to your full pet. Um, and the coverage was very good. Here the coverage isn't so good. And because this is a protectant fungicide, it was not protected. And here we miss the leaf, which is, you know, not too uncommon, no matter what kind of plant you're spraying. And you can see there's a lot of disease that's going on. Now, if we compare this to the strobal urine fungicides, and azoxystrobin is uh, heritage in the US, and uh, this is Compass uh, as well, and this is the old Cygnus. You can see that in the case of heritage, you get protection not just where you treat it, but also going up the leaf. So even if you miss coverage, you still get protection. And if we were to flip all of these over, you would see the underside of the leaf in this area here protected as well. And this is why I think these are great fungicides. Even though they're great fungicides, the risk of resistance for many pathogens towards these fungicides is very high. And if we think this is going to carry our um, quality control further in the long term, I, I think we're going to be in for a surprise. Okay, so um, we have to come up with a disease management strategy. We have to come up with a diagnosis first, um, and then we uh, need to make sure that we can look through all the different classes of fungicides. Um, we want to make sure that we're not just relying on fungicides, and we've done all of the cultural controls we have that we can because um, it just puts too much pressure on the fungicide and increases the risk of resistance. Furthermore, if you are using a biological, um, if you have poor cultural conditions, the biological is less likely to succeed as well. Um, so one of the things to keep in mind when you're looking at all of these materials is that you'll often have several materials in the same class. And I included a handout in dealing with fungicide rotations to help you understand the different classes and how to develop your fungicide rotations. That's beyond the scope of this, but I did want to make sure you had that information available to you. Here's where I give you some data instead of just like the extension talk. Um, and also want to talk to you a little bit about statistics because there's a lot of uh, information out there. And um, to my mind, when they show you their statistics, their statistics are a lot like bikinis. Um, and what they show you is interesting and what they hide is essential. And things are very complicated. And the second we try to say how complicated things are, uh, I, I know people's eyes glaze over and I get accused of being an egghead. And uh, the, the problem is, is that especially in our industry, we're not just looking at you know wheat, for example, where we have you know, one host wheat and we have like a dozen diseases. We have hundreds of hosts and thousands of diseases. Uh, and so we could say that something is good on say botrytis, but it might only be good on botrytis on geranium. It might not be as effective as bet on botrytis on a very susceptible vinca. And so this is where it gets complicated and why clear cut answers are oftentimes a challenge. And the example, since you, you're Canadian, is I thought I had to give you a very Canadian example of hockey. Um, and so what I did when I put the rest of this information together is I, I combined all my algorithms, spreadsheets, and statistics and slide rules to come up with who was the best hockey player of all time, which I'm totally kidding. Um, because one, actually, I do like hockey, and I do watch hockey, and really wanted to marry Marc Messier when I was much younger. Um, the reality is, is how you evaluate what the best is changes depending on how you do your evaluating. And of course, if you say who the best player is, are we talking about score leaders, uh, goals per game, um, points per game overall, or what about goalies and saves? So suddenly, all of our statistics change. And I don't think people take this into account. They just want the quote unquote best fungicide. And unfortunately, there is no best, just like, you know, this would be like saying, well, you know, Wayne Gretzky can't be the best player because you know he's not even on this list of goalies. Of course not, he wasn't a goalie. Um, but that's like saying, what's the best fungicide for Phytophthora? 
Um, and is that expected to be the same for powdery mildew? Uh, the answer is no. There are different fungicides that are the best for different situations. So when we talk about deployment, uh, we want to keep in mind that there aren't silver bullets. Um, and like I just said before, we wouldn't evaluate Patrick Law on the number of, of goals. Um, and we wouldn't any more than we'd evaluate Messier and uh, Gretzky on the number of saves. And yes, I lived in New York when they played together, so I'm sorry. Um, going back to looking at our statistics, this is actually data from one of my trials looking at um, what gave the best control of botrytis in geranium leaves. And what I have here are a number of products. We have Decree, which has an active ingredient of fenhexamid. Um, Broadform is one of the 7-Elevens from Bayer. Um, so this means that it has a QOI, uh, the same one that's in Compass, and it also has a new 7-SDHI fungicide, which is uh, fluopyram, at two different concentrations. And then I have two different biological that are formulated differently. Serenade, which is a bacillus subtilis, um, with an ASO formulation and Opti formulation. And what I just wanted to show you is I use two different ways of measuring them, just like you know, goalies, um, goals save versus uh, points per game. Um, Fishers is very liberal and it finds differences where one may not exist, like you can see over here. Um, whereas Tukey's actually kind of lumps things together. And when I look at this data, what I would like for you to actually see as well is the fact that Decree really gave the best possible protection, broad form just as well. Serenade Opti over here though is, is actually did a pretty good job. Um, what we need to consider though is that our disease pressure was not particularly high. What happens if the disease pressure is high? Um, well, I, I don't have that data here. Um, I can tell you from other data, and I'll show you later on, um, those results uh, tend to fall apart when disease pressure is high. When we look at some of the biologicals and look over here, we're looking at gray mold, and I apologize, this is on snap beans. We're, we just simply don't have a lot of research. Here's our old standby, Ipridione. Um, and you can see here that um, the control untreated had 10% gray mold. Um, in reality, with the exception of Iprodione, most of them did not give very good control, but this level of control here with either Soil Guard or Melsana, because they all have B, meaning it overlaps as far as how effective they are, statistically speaking, and uh, Root Shield, uh, it was the same as not doing anything at all. Uh, so these are some of the things I want you to keep in mind. Now, obviously, for beans, they're interested in yield. For us, it's how they look. So we're just looking at percent disease. Uh, here we have Pythium, uh, similar using soil guard to actually control Pythium. And you can see that the overall mean stand count with um, using soil guard um, or plant uh, shield or companion uh, none of these were really good. In fact, that you actually uh, had better, uh, of course, uninoculated, but with your inoculated, it really was not significantly different at this point. So um, I'm not, I keep using biologicals because I keep hoping I will find something that works really well. Uh, to date, for the most part, what I find with biologicals is that they require a lot of work and the uh, what you get out I don't personally believe is as good as the effort you put in. So I'm going to go back to my examples of botrytis. And when we talk about cultural controls and management, you know, making sure your spacing is good is a very important part of breaking that disease triangle. Making sure you, your humidity levels are good um, to avoid uh, tulip fire. Uh, your watering practices, so the plants are not getting wet, but just the roots are getting wet. Uh, removing any infected foliage or plant parts when you see it happen. And then, of course, which crops are the most susceptible. You can see the signs there of the disease in the, the previous slide right here, which is this gray sporulation. I don't think people can really appreciate the number of spores this fungus produces. So if you take a look at like your pinky finger, and I'm assuming you have the hands the size of a 10-year-old 
kid because that's what I was told my hands were. But if you look at your pinky nail, you could easily put close to a million spores on that pinky nail. If you're a big guy, you could probably put two, three, or four million dollars on the of spores, two to three, four million spores on your pinky nail. Um, they really are prolific in their production of spores. This generally happens in the kind of weather we're having here right now, cloudy and overcast. Um, where the humidity kind of ticks up as well. So here are some of the fungicides that are labeled for control. One thing to keep in mind, and I know this one's on your list of things to go bye-bye, um, one of the best fungicides, Ipridione, um, we do have resistance issues. Um, you do have Heritage and Compass labeled. Um, I wasn't sure which of the, uh, S of the uh, DMI fungicides, the FRAC3s that you had, but um, all of these are really uh, not particularly effective, even though they are labeled. I really like chlorothalonil as a cleanup step to make sure you don't end up with resistance with these guys here or this one here. Uh, Phenhexamid and medallion are, uh, or flutioxanil and medallion are also quite good. Make sure your plants are um, actually uh, spaced well to promote that drying, uh, minimizing the overhead watering. Keeping things clean is huge. I know it's like next to impossible, but it's just so important. Um, and then when conditions are gray and cloudy like they are right now in this extended cool spring, making sure you have this prophylactic application of fungicide. Now, if things are well spaced and uh, plants are well maintained, you might be able to get away uh, with really good control using some of the biologicals like Serenade. You might not have much of a disease problem to begin with. Um, Alternatively, you could use uh, perhaps one of the 7-Eleven fungicides, uh, such as uh, pageant as an example. Um, here's where I'm showing you some data from, as I mentioned earlier, uh, our field trial. And this was, again, peonies, which is probably our, our biggest cut flower. Um, and some of the diseases we have, we regularly get cladosporium, which is peony measles. We do sometimes get a little bit of cercospora, but that hasn't shown up. We get a lot of powdery mildew, but it was so wet it didn't show up last year. And of course, botrytis. And it turns out that there are several different species of botrytis. So kind of your classic botrytis scenario, and then your botrytis paonia as well. So I've already talked to you about statistics. Um, Hopefully you are now as moved by statistics and plant disease as I am. Um, one of the things you wanna keep in mind is um, identifying all those factors of what we need to be successful. And so with this trial, we started spraying very early on. Um, we wanted to make sure we could get the flowers to market, but then we kept spraying and we will be evaluating in the next few weeks to see what our return bloom is on our peonies. Um, I black these out because they're confidential products, but you can see here, this is uh, a new product by BASF, which is a 7-Eleven. This is the 7-Eleven from Bayer. Um, and this is Serenade Opti. And here you can see that the Serenade Opti uh, was really, providing not very good control. I would say it was probably cutting the disease level down by half compared to all the other products. Um, and we were applying this product twice, at twice the frequency as we were the conventional fungicides. So um, that was actually very disconcerting because I really thought if we upped our game, we could get similar results, but uh, we simply couldn't. And by the end of the season, it just didn't look well. Here, where I showed you that uh, little cartoon about, you know, they're all giving the, the side eye to the bar that has all this variation. This is a very difficult uh, set of data to interpret because there was so much variation. And so it would be very difficult to say that any of these products really controlled um, uh, cladosporium effectively, maybe over here, um, excuse me, over here we could say in the early summer that the broad form was very good for controlling uh, cladosporium peony measles. I had to cobble a bunch of things together um, because then the next issue is what about your residue? And these are issues. Decree does have a residue. Uh, Ipridione has a residue. I really like the pageant and the medallion, uh, particularly with capsule because you don't get that residue. 
Serenade ASO was fantastic as far as not having residue, but it did not control botrytis as well in different trials, and I, I looked at several um, compared to Serenade Opti, but Serenade Opti made it look like a cat threw up um, the plant, so that's obviously not too acceptable. Um, but if earlier on in the season you wanted to rely on this product instead and then switch over, it could give you the results that you wanted. How much do these products cost in comparison? Um, if you're focusing on biologicals like Microstop, and this is based on uh, recent numbers here, uh, it would cost you $35 for five grams, which goes to 100 gallons. Um, so it ends up being about 10 cents per plant total. Um, you could see the conventional fungicides actually are much less expensive. Uh, this is your risk to uh, assess, but from our calculations repeatedly and over and over, we found that the conventional fungicides ended up being uh, significantly less, and this isn't factoring in labor either, so uh, something to keep in mind. So what I did was tried to take all of the data that I had and went to um, one of our journals called Plant Disease Management Reports, where many of us publish our data and see who most which products most consistently gave uh, reliable disease control. And what we found was um, the 7-Eleven fungicides across the board gave some of the best control with the lowest level of residue. The old product, Ipridione, if you don't have fungicide resistance, it works great. If you do have fungicide resistance, it sucks. Um, I still like Dacanil. One is a cleanup step. You guys have full pet. Um, thiophanate methyl used to work really well. Resistance is hit and miss. If you have it, it's not going to be a good product. If you don't, it does work fairly well. Um, lots of different products here you can see. And as always, if uh, anyone is interested, please email me because I'm happy to share this information. So one of the next big house, big diseases that we see a lot of is powdery mildew. Um, we generally see this later on in the season when the humidity um, is, uh, that should be humidity above 93%, not below 93%, I apologize. Um, this is one of my favorite photos and I know you guys aren't doing woodies, but this could be like a replacement for Dusty Miller. Um, and lots of crops are particularly prone to uh, powdery mildew. Uh, going back to the whole thing with genetic resistance, we probably have more resistance to powdery mildew than anything else, but resistance is an immunity. And here's Phlox David, which was the perennial plant of the year with powdery mildew, those aren't petals. Um, pruning things out, keeping airflow good and keeping everything well watered um, is really important. Recognizing that for the most part, powdery mildew comes in after the plant starts senescing. Lots of fungicides available for you and for uh, us here in the States. Here is another one of our trials. Um, Luna Sensation is now called Broad Form. These are 7-Eleven fungicides. You can see I got really good disease inc incidence over time. And you can see across the board, all of these fungicides gave excellent control. I would say this one, this one, and these are all going to be incredibly expensive. Eagle is um, even generic, so it's going to be much less expensive. Uh, Compass is sort of being phased out as well, so it will be much less expensive. So we're once again stuck with this question of what's the best fungicide. And one of the things about um, Eagle and your FRAC3 fungicides, which are so effective against um, powdery mildews, is the fact that they also have plant growth regulator effect. And here you can see uh, Benbuconazole treated uh, hazel compared to untreated. And now some people think this looks way better um, than this here, and that would be great if we were growing cut leaves. But one of the problems with these fungicides is it does reduce floriferousness. Um, it also inhibits uh, cut it, rooting on cuttings, so you want to be careful when you deploy them. If I was controlling uh, powdery mildew in any sort of cut flower or greenhouse setting, I would probably work on a rotation um, out in the field involving Dacanil, involving a FRAC code 11 or FRAC code 711 fungicide. 
if I don't have resistance, thiophanate methyl is still a great fungicide. Um, and then any of the FRAC3. I like Eagle. It sort of smells, I'm told, I don't smell it anymore. Um, but there's a lot of DMI fungicides out there, and there are more coming as well. Of course, I would start with resistance because I would really not have to apply until probably, you know, a month after I would for something that's susceptible, and I wouldn't have to apply as often even after harvest to make sure I had good return bloom if I was growing something like peonies in a cut flower setting. Okay, so at this point, I know I'm pretty close to my time is up. I can go over bacterial diseases or we can take questions. Uh, is it just a couple of slides, Shanna? It is just a couple of slides. Yeah, let's do it then. We all like bacterial diseases here in Canada. I was gonna say, who doesn't like bacterial diseases? <laughs> They are, are becoming an absolute nightmare, which is unfortunate and uh, only getting worse. So I don't think anybody's gonna like the news that I give you out of this, but um, the reality is, is that there are over 200 different plant pathogenic bacteria and all of them are a pain in the butt to manage. Um, trying to keep these pathogens out of the greenhouse is really the key to effective management. Um, trying to minimize, if possible, the, the work with some of these, um, whether you call them Trojan horses or typhoid marys. Um, I, I always think of the, the Rieger begonias as just uh, a point of Xanthomonas entry. Um, they also, a point of entry is often through uh, watering, if watering is being, if water is being recycled. Um, and then of course, once it gets in there, it just spreads like wildfire. Um, it spreads by water, it spreads through cuttings, it spreads through uh, pinching, it spreads through ebb and flow benches. Um, insects also spread it, so I think I probably could do a, a shorter list of what doesn't spread it. Um, and the reason this is such a problem is that our management options are so limited in controlling these things. So eradication is huge. I would make sure that you end up removing any affected plants and also any plants in I would say about a one and a half foot slash half meter radius um, and just dispose of them, uh, no questions asked. Uh, after doing that, you know, make sure you wash your hands, wash your tools. You wanna do this when the plants are dry so you don't inadvertently spread the disease, uh, whichever bacterial pathogen it is. Soaking the tools in 10% bleach will help. Um, it is corrosive. Um, I would actually recommend more of the Quaternary ammonia products. Um, sterilizing the greenhouse between production cycles. Copper is interesting, and I'm going to show you guys some data. And I'm, I hope Anne didn't do this previously. Um, and if she did, I apologize. But I really like the comprehensive nature of this. And I'm a, a big partner in the IR4 project. Uh, where they looked at a bunch of different products and tried to, to make some sense because it seemed just like I told you, in one instance, one product was the best, whether it was um, Actinovate or Pencazeb, and then they do the trial again with a different host and it didn't work so well. And here you could actually see some of the data that was summarized. And if you go to the IR4 website, all of this is online. And you can see that they had excellent control with copper for xanthomonia, uh, xanthomonas on um, geranium, but they didn't have very good control with copper when they were looking at xanthomonas on kale. And so this goes back to the whole host difference. And then what they did was try to combine this to, to get an overall view. And what they found was that, you know, here, when you get this kind of variation, um, this probably isn't going to be a particularly reliable product for a lot of different um, host plants. And as you work your way down, things may not even, you know, this shows that it um, consistently didn't work. So this is something we probably don't want to uh, look at. But over here, we can see that these three copper products, Cupro, Junction, and Camelot, reliably gave with very little variation, at least in this overall composite uh, control. This was against Xanthomonas, um, and you can see once again all over the place. So the Ace of Benzilar did excellent in this instance. It doesn't do well on anything else, but if you're trying to control 
uh, Xanthomonas, you can see here that it gave excellent results um, for this system. If you look at it for Orwinia, it was terrible, but then again, pretty much nothing was very good for Orwinia. So you really want to try and keep the soft rots out and anything that facilitates uh, soft rot establishment. Uh, Pseudomonas, Phyton 27 over here gave really good tight control, as did the, I can never pronounce this, Acebenzilar. So we managed to get through that. Hopefully you, you understand a little bit. I, I guess what I, I'm hoping you get from this is that there isn't any one best answer, but that you can look at um, the evidence that people give you uh, to try and decide what the best answer is for you. Um, I'll be continuing to publish things like this in our Purdue Landscape Report. And once again, here is my email. Please feel free to email me. Sometimes my uh, response time lags. Um, Please also feel free to send me a reminder. Um, I don't get angry, it's just I get forgetful. So with that, uh, thank you for your time and uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Jana. Um, at this point, everyone, I just wanna remind you about if you've got any questions for Jana, to type them into um, the questions box on uh, your screen controls on the right-hand side. Um, and we might be able to get to some of those today. If not, we can post them up on the Greenhouse Canada uh, magazine website afterwards. Um, but I do have some questions of my own before we get to some from the audience. Um, Jana, I'm curious, you mentioned a lot of um, positive efficacy from what you're calling the 7-Eleven fungicides, mm -hmm. obviously those that are a combination of the FRAC group 7 and 11. We only really have pristine um, that falls into that group, but I am curious, is it, sort of like a multi-site of action thing that makes them so um, good at their job? Or is there some sort of synergy happening between those two frac groups? Uh, so I think it's a combination of synergy and uh, the uh, mobility of the different fungicides. In the case of the uh, 11, groups, the QOI fungicides, this would have been like the old Compass or Cygnus or, um, gosh, now I'm blanking, uh, Insignia. What these are able to do is they're translaminar and so they can go through the leaf and give you very good protection. The, the seven fungicides actually uh, tend to adhere very well to the leaf surface and also if they come in contact with any pathogens, and so that's kind of like a two four. And by putting them together, uh, we ended up seeing overall just better foliar disease control. It, it's so there's definitely the synergism going on there. And it was so successful um, with what you're calling pristine. And in the US, we call pageant uh, for ornamentals that the other companies came up with their own formulations, which are also um, just as effective uh, so it's, it won't cure everything, but it's very good against your true fungi, um, it, uh, in particular, your foliar disease problems. Okay, great. Um, I also was curious about, you mentioned there's definitely times to put on fungicides uh, prophylactically before you even see uh, disease symptoms necessarily develop. Um, so you mentioned things like cloudy periods, rainy periods, or are there any other times when you would do that? Um, so for example, if you've had an issue with a disease regularly in your crop or a previous year, is there risk from resting spores or based on your experience, um, when would you tell growers to do a prophylactic spray sort of no matter what? So I think a lot of it depends because there's so much diversity. I mean, are we talking in the greenhouse or are we talking for cut flowers in the field or? I guess we're talking in the greenhouse, yeah, or okay. cut flowers in the greenhouse, if that's a possibility. Cut, cut flowers in the greenhouse. So um, I would say if you have had a history of any of the root borne problems, you know, this being like your Thalabiopsis or your Pythiums or your Phytophthoras, Rhizoctonia, Fusarium, um, that's a history uh, that included loss, I would definitely include uh, something like a Banrot, which is a combination of thiophanate methyl and etradiazole, um, and that will prevent damping off and early root rot symptoms. Um, I'm 
I'm trying to think. I would also be really careful with sanitation um, in cleaning whenever you're recycling or reusing trays. Uh, for certain plant pathogens, Pythium has that really thick spore wall um, and Thalaviopsis also has that really thick spore wall. You really want to make sure that um, the trays that you're using are clean. So instead of actually going in with a fungicide, um, using, this is why I like the products like the uh, Quaternary Ammonia compounds. You could also use bleach, but make sure you use a detergent because that actually gets it in through the spore. If you just use right. bleach, spores can resist. Um, if you just use soap, it won't kill the spores. Using bleach and soap together really does the job or a quaternary ammonia. Um, so that wouldn't be so much a spray, but it's something you can do early on to prevent disease from occurring. Um, I'm trying to think here. Yeah, and we do have a quaternary ammonia in Canada. Um, it's clean grow. That's what we've got registered okay. up here. So. Yeah, I mean, any of those, there's a number of them, but those really, uh, I, I just was working with a grower who has lost about $30,000 worth of plants to Thalaviopsis, and he had been reusing wow. his trees um, for years without having a problem, and it just exploded this last year. And and so um, that that's the sort of stuff that, it's, it's right on the forefront of my mind, that if I could remind people Sanitation is the, the basis of any sort of successful plant disease management. Mm -hmm. And speaking of black rot, that's something I did want to ask you about. Um, you did mention uh, near the beginning of the talk um, that uh, controlling pH um, and keeping it down was um, very important for black root rot control, especially when you've had it in your greenhouse before. Um, uh -huh. Questions I often get from growers are whether or not other root diseases also respond to different pHs. So Pythium and Fusarium, are, are there pH changes you can make to inhibit those diseases as well? Or is that sort of specific to black root rot? It isn't specific to black root rot, but it's probably the most dramatic that you'll see. Uh, Pythium, if you do lower the pH, you can actually reduce the disease, but you'll have so many other problems in that process because the pH needs to get so low that mm. it wouldn't, I, I wouldn't recommend it for most instances. Um, I'm trying to think of others. I guess I look at it, if you think of it as an entire system, and I hope I'm not making this too complicated, um, when the pH isn't correct, let's say it's above 6.5 or below 6, and you start to get the iron chlorosis and things like that, the plants aren't growing well to begin with because they're already um, deficient in iron to produce all the enzymes needed. So it kind of, it, it isn't so much that the pH makes, the pH makes the plant healthier. It doesn't so much impact the pathogen at that point. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've got one more question, I think, depending on our time. Um, I'm curious to know, uh, you mentioned that Purdue um, has some extension resources regarding resistance to different diseases in various plants. Um, besides that, what's a good resource for growers? Like, is this information that's easy to get from the breeders or is this something more that growers sort of have to determine year to year and how would a grower go about doing this on their own farm? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I would uh, recommend that they talk to their seed brokers. Most actually will promote resistance um, and take what they're saying though with a, a grain of salt unless they actually have data to show you. A lot of times people will say this appears to be resistant and it turns out that it's an escape. The other problem with that is that within all of our different geographies, we all have different populations. And so something that's resistant in one part of the world to a disease may not be resistant to uh, that pathogen in another part of the world. Uh, we see this a lot with roses and black spot, for example. Um, so, so just be careful with that. If a grower was interested in doing this, uh, there's a lot of really good books on um, uh, evaluating uh, seed sources, and I'm trying to, to remember what they are, and I will have to email you the name of it because I'm drawing a blank. Um, 
But what I would recommend is taking out several of the different seeds that they have and 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 testing them. I showed you uh, an area that the begonias that you could see the susceptibility to powdery mildew. And uh, this grower I work with is he just personally loves begonias and uh, he always has begonias and he's always just running through different begonias, trying you know the newest and uh, you know the latest and greatest, but also the old standbys as well. So he's constantly. Right. You know, and so escargot coming up as, you know, powdery mildew susceptible was a bit of a surprise um, because he hadn't started, you know, he had just started growing it a few years ago. Um, and I hadn't seen reports prior to that, but that turned out to be what it was. But you could see all the other ones looked really quite good. Well, thanks so much, Jana. I think we're out of time for questions. Um, the rest will be answered on uh, the Greenhouse Canada website. And this concludes our seminar series on Let's Talk Disease and Ornamentals. And thank you so much for all the speakers' participation, especially uh, Jana to be our last one and capping it off. We really appreciate that. Thank you so much. And actually a big thank you to Sarah Jandrasik for initiating and organizing this entire webinar series. To the audience, as a reminder, a copy of the webinar recording will be sent out tomorrow to everybody who registered, and the handouts will be made available online at greenhousecanada.com. This may be the last of our ornamental disease series, but there's more great content to be found. Visit onfloriculture.wordpress.com, which is a website regularly updated by Sarah and her colleagues at OMAFRA. So thank you for joining us. And if you have any questions, suggestions, or positive comments, feel free to email us at greenhouse at annexweb.com. Thank you.